So tell me about Lambda School and why you started the company. Yeah, I mean, so at a high level, I moved to San Francisco from a small town in Utah and basically just saw that there was a lot happening in tech, a lot of opportunity that I thought my friends back home ought to have access to. Um, but there wasn't really a good way to help someone from small town Utah break into technology. So our, our entire focus was making something that's online and accessible. Um, and yeah, our, really our, our vision is to help everybody unlock their potential regardless of circumstance. So that's kind of the North Star that we always think of when we're talking about what we do. You're a founder. Mm -hmm. You're here presenting and you're very composed, you're very articulate. And underneath it all, I know you're working really, really hard. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I've always heard the analogy of the, the duck, right? That's totally calm under the surface, or over the surface, but under the surface is paddling like crazy and trying to figure things out. Um, that's very much how I feel. Like, um, and I think for us especially, our brand externally has become very strong. Um, and we're growing at a pretty insane pace. Um, and then inside, it's honestly Herculean efforts of a, you know, right now 130 people just trying to do everything they can to make sure every student has a great experience. Um, so psychologically, there are really good days and there are really bad days. Yeah, managing that I think is honestly one of the most difficult and important parts of founding a company. The difficulty of being a founder is just managing your own psychology and remaining even keel throughout. No, no matter what's happening, you're, you're level-headed, you're looking at the data, you're understanding what the market says, what your students says, what the data says, um, and you're doing as best as you can to operate within that. But in your metaphor, you're saying like you, you, it's important that you present level-headed, but you don't always feel level-headed under the surface. No, I mean, I try to feel level-headed, but am not successful in doing yeah. so often. You know, I think you learn over time that when there's that euphoric moment, you start to tell yourself, okay, this is, you know, we're not as good as people are saying we are right now. We're not as good as what is happening right now. Um, and then when something really bad is happening, you have enough ammo to say, actually, we're not that bad either. You're clearly experiencing a lot of success. The team is growing fast. There's a lot of students pouring into your school. You're achieving all of the things that a founder really wants to achieve. Sure. And I imagine you've been through your share of rejection. Yes. Could you tell me about that and how you handled it? Oh, man. Um, so this actually isn't the first company that I started. Um, I started another company that failed in a pretty magnificent way. We were about to raise our next round of funding. We had a billionaire household name investor who was going to lead that round. Uh, we we're running out of money, but it's fine because we, you know, we already had a term sheet. We we're about to sign. We we're signing docs. We we're about to get a wire. Um, and then that person just called me. Well, he had his assistant call me and say, "Actually, we're out." And um, end of company. Right. Yeah, it was, it was the 23rd of December, and I had to call everybody and say, it's over. There's Two days before Christmas, you had to call everyone in the company and tell everybody that you were folding. Correct, correct. Um, and you know, my daughter had been in the hospital for a while, so we were completely out of savings, basically. Um, so yeah, that was rough. As a CEO of a company, you have one job, and that is to make sure the company doesn't fail. So by definition, I just failed at the only job that I had, mm -hmm. right? And in retrospect, could I have done something differently? Maybe, I don't know. I didn't, but I don't know that I would have done anything differently with the information I had at the time. Um, but that, that doesn't really matter. People are still trying to figure out how to get their kids Christmas that year and it's my fault now. And yeah. Fairly so, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember driving by a golf course one time and looking at the guy that was, you know, walking around, had the little um, cart and picking up all the golf balls. And I remember telling my wife, like, I could probably do that, right? Like, I, you know, I may not be able to be a tech CEO, but I could probably pick up the golf balls. Mm -hmm. um, and she's always way more level-headed than I was, and I was way down at the bottom. And she kind of pulled me back up. But that's that's how I felt, like. 
could I, would I screw that up or would I be able to pick up the golf balls? So here you were, you had a company that failed, you mm -hmm. don't have a college degree, mm -hmm. and you're out of money. Mm -hmm. And now you had to pick yourself back up, believe in yourself again, and find, find a job. Yep. Now I really understand why you've built a company that's all about creating access. I was really, really lucky, right? I, and it was still really hard. I had to move out to Silicon Valley and live in a car, which is not something you would expect anybody to do. I wrote a book, which is not something you'd expect somebody to do. It got picked up by the right person at the right time. Um, and without that, I don't know if I would be having this conversation right now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel a whole lot of empathy when I'm talking to students who don't have credentials, they don't have work history, they're, they're just trying to break their way into something that, you know, from an outside perspective, maybe you have no right to be in, but it doesn't matter because that's where you want to be, so you have to find a way to get there. Um, so, so yeah, the, it's a very personal mission for me. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. As you know, Torch is a leadership development company, and so coaching is of extreme interest to us. Mm -hmm. When do you find yourself coaching your students on things that pertain to leadership? Uh, yeah, so it's funny because when we started, I was kind of of the naive opinion that we'll just train people technically and then the rest will take care of itself. Um, demonstrably not true. So now we, we actually have we, what we call career workshops that are built into the curriculum itself. And now they're not all technical. They involve leadership, they involve collaboration, they involve other stuff. We found in the early days that there are people who could you know, code like you couldn't believe, but they still weren't getting hired or they still weren't working out in teams. Um, and now I'm, I'm of the opinion that you know, technical skills are table stakes, but where you really get hired or not is based on your ability to interact and work with groups and find out what the right job is to be done and do it. Um, and of course you have to be able to do the technical work, um, but that alone is not sufficient. And someone asked me the other day, if you didn't do anything other than just technical skills, right? Um, what percentage of your students get hired on the other side? Um, I think it's probably 40%. Interestingly, I think not only do we not serve our students well, but our business literally fails if we don't teach you how to work on teams. If you're an employer, what you're really looking for is someone that can easily integrate with your team and start working and getting stuff done within that team. Um, so if you are a rock star coder and you think you're gonna come in and break everything and yell at everybody, it's, it's not enough. It's not a win.